crowdsourcing, crowd attending. Oh, we had an even number of participants and a round one. So let's start. Once again, for the nth time, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all. My name is Katya Malinova. I'll be moderating today's presentation. I'm at McMaster University in Canada and good evening, good morning, good afternoon to all of you, depending on where you are. So this is a slightly unusual version of the microstructure exchange. We're very pleased to have the world premiere presentation of the FinCAP project today. Uh, we'll have uh, the following sequence of events. So we'll start uh, with the presentation by Albert Mengfeld and Anna Dreiber um, of the project. So Anna is at the Stockholm School of Economics and Albert is, is at BU Amsterdam. The presentation will take about 40 minutes and the presentation will be short, uh, followed by a statement from uh, Michael Noy, who is at Urex. Then we'll take a 10 minute break. Um, you'll get the chance to refill your water, get a coffee, uh, wave hi potentially to everyone. And then we'll have two excellent discussions discussing the paper. First, we'll have Amit Gayal uh, from Lausanne. And then we'll have Eric Ullman from INSEAD. Eric is uh, in behavioral and organizational behavior, and he's done a number of papers on crowdsourcing. So he'll have a, a more general uh, science overview of crowdsourcing research projects. After that, we'll open up for Q&A. We'll have about 20 minutes for Q&A. Uh, I also would like to remind you that this uh, seminar is recorded. So um, you all agreed to, to this when uh, you signed up. So this is a webinar format, not a meeting. So to ask a question, there are two possible avenues. First, you can send it in the Q&A, and uh, you may also upvote the Q&A. If you like a particular question, please don't ask it again. Just upvote the one that is already there so that we know that there is a lot of interest in it. And second, you may raise a hand, and then uh, we'll call on you and unmute you, and uh, you'll get a chance to answer your question in person. So thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, and now the floor is Anna's and Albert's. The floor is all yours. You have 40 minutes. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, everyone, for being here. Uh, thanks, first of all, all the co-authors on this. And I'm not going to show who all of you are because Albert will show that. But so I'm not mentioning any authors here because there are so many. But thanks, everyone, for participating in this. And thanks uh, to the panelists and everyone for being here. And everyone who's not participating but who's part of the audience, welcome too, and super interesting to hear your thoughts. Okay, so I'm Anna Dreber. I'm gonna give some background to the project and then Albert will go into details about what we have done in this particular project. So I'll give some general background to why we even started doing this and uh, yeah, what where this can be situated. Sort of in the okay. Um, so in many fields, we're, we're talking about a replication crisis. So this is not just a social science phenomena, but there are also discussions about a replication crisis in medicine. Uh, so what does this mean? This basically means that many results cannot be replicated. When we try to redo studies using new material, new data, uh, sometimes same material, but basically with new data, many results turn out not to replicate. So here I'm showing you... Uh, three big projects in which we have participated. So it's a little bit self-serving, but these are basically big replication projects uh, from psychology and economics, where we've tried to take experiments published in top journals in psychology or in economics like the AER and QGE, or in general science like nature and science. We redo these experiments with high statistical power and we basically find that many results do not replicate. So in a big psychology project, it was shown that about a third of the results replicated, only a third. In economics, it was slightly better. And then for nature and science, about half of the results replicated. So these are obviously not good news. And yet this is in the world of experiments where we can redo stuff. We can get new data by just redoing the experiments uh, with new samples, typically students or some other accessible subject pool. But these projects, along with many others, have led to what we call the replication crisis. Uh, so potential reasons for the, this replication crisis could be the so-called many researcher degrees of freedom. So we all know we shouldn't go out fishing um, and just correlating a bunch of variables. Something will be statistically significant by chance. We know we should avoid that. We see some students maybe doing it sometimes, but that's not really sort of what we worry about. 
Then there are these other phenomena referred to as p-hacking um, or the garden of forking paths. So even if you're testing a very specific hypothesis that, and you design an experiment, so we're in the best of causal worlds, there are many ways in which you can test this hypothesis. Uh, if I get, if I do my first type of regression and I have a p-value of my treatment variable of 0.051, what happens if I control for gender? Can I get p to be less than 0.05 or something else? If I'm doing such activities, I would be engaged in p-hacking. With p-hacking, you could see some weird distribution of, of uh, histograms of p-values like the one I show you here. Uh, and I guess sort of we all realize we shouldn't be p-hacking, but then it can be natural to do it anyway. But maybe the more common phenomena is what Gelman and Loken call the garden of working paths. So here you basically have some hypothesis that you are testing, be it with experimental data or some other type of data, but you haven't specified exactly how you will test it. So you let the data tell you how to analyze it. At the end of the day, some, somewhere along the path that you choose endogenously, depending on the data, uh, something will be statistically significant somewhere. And the problem is, of course, that this p-value is pretty uninteresting. So what have we actually learned? So that these are phenomena that are discussed in many types of literatures. Um, it can be hard to understand whether p-hacking or forking is actually going on um, in a given data set. So there are some nice examples from, for example, Brodeur et al, that you can see on the left here, where they go through uh, three top econ journals and search for evidence of p-hacking. So basically, they're looking for missing p-values uh, corresponding to about 0.05 to 0.25, or mainly between 0.10 and 0.25, since we sometimes call p less than 0.10 as statistically significant. And when you have this... Um, two peaks and a valley, that's evidence of p-hacking. And they basically find evidence of p-hacking in most uh, literatures. This, these are not things that, I mean, you, most of you probably know about these phenomena, and there are many interesting examples from finance in particular uh, discussing these. So I've just included two uh, super interesting examples here, but there are many more. So one potential solution, solution to these problems, to avoid p-hacking and maybe the forking, which is even more natural, is to have so-called pre-analysis plans. Uh, in a pre-analysis plan, you would specify exactly how you do the data collection, how you define variables, how you do the analysis, how you would exclude potential outliers, etc. And that's great, because then you can avoid these many research degrees of freedom. And the whole idea here is that exploratory analysis can be super interesting, but the problem is that is when they are presented as confirmatory and a pre-analysis plan would make clear what's confirmatory and what's uh, exploratory. But one potential not really problem as something to consider when thinking about pre-analysis plans is of course that the pre-analysis plan is just one fork in the garden of forking paths. Okay, at the end of the day, we, we with the pre-analysis plan, we get a meaningful p-value from our analysis uh, but the problem is, depending on which researcher you ask to write the pre-analysis plan for a specific project, you can end up with many different forks depending on who you are asking. So different researchers might choose different forks or pre-analysis plan. So this would then result in it, not any type of systematic bias in effect sizes that we see, but if different researchers choose different types of analysis, um, pre-analysis plans will underestimate the standard error in the statistical test. And that's why it can potentially be interesting uh, to do basically what we've done in this project, we argue. So there are different ways to think about uh, how one can look at the data. So one way be, would be to basically use the so-called many analysts or multi-analyst approach that we're gonna talk about more here today. And that's basically looking at what's the natural variation in analysis and results in a given data set. Um, the other option would be to look at uh, the theoretically justified set of analysis and results in a given data set. So this would be using the so-called multiverse analysis, uh, often referred to in medicine as the vibration of effects analysis, or sometimes referred to in psychology as specification curve analysis. These are basically three different names for the same phenomena. Um, so one could do both. What we have done in this particular project is basically this many analysts or multi-analyst approach. So I guess the main reason for why Eric is here, I mean, Eric's fantastic in many ways. We have co-authored many papers, so it's awesome that you're here. But the one reason for why you're here in particular today, I guess, is uh, your landmark paper. So Eric and his co-authors uh, did a study that was published a few years ago 
which is a landmark study on this topic, where they gave the same data set of soccer data or football data, I would like to say, to a bunch of different researchers and asked them to test the same hypothesis, basically whether more dark-skinned players were more likely to get red cards. Uh, so they were given the same data, the same hypothesis, and then asked to report back, basically, what are your results? So they find this variation in results. I mean, most of these teams find statistically significant positive results, uh, but then there's quite some variation in effect sizes. And some um, teams also find statistically non-significant, uh, not statistically significant results. And this led to lots of headlines, but I would say that most projects that have come up after this actually find a lot more variation in results than this uh, landmark paper. So by now there are a bunch of papers and I think we'll hear more from Eric about them, but I'd like to just sort of situate our paper a bit in this literature. So some of us uh, did a big neuroscience project, neuroscience, neuroeconomics, where the same data was given to 70 different teams who were asked to test the same nine hypotheses. There's also another project in economics where uh, two replication studies were basically done, uh, where seven analysts were uh, looking at each uh, seven, yeah, the, a total of 12 analysts, but seven on each hypothesis were, were trying to replicate these studies. There are two recent uh, big uh, many analyst projects in psychology, uh, one by Bresnau et al, where they have one hypothesis um, that, is, that is given to 73 different teams. They're asked to test this one hypothesis on the same data. And Eric has another project with Schweinsberg et al, where they had 14 to 15 analysts for each of two hypotheses. And the results basically suggest that there is tons of variation in results when you have the same data uh, test with, and ask researchers to test the same hypothesis. And uh, that's sort of the background. And then we're going to come to our particular project. And I'm going to stop. And now it's time for uh, Albert to continue. Thanks. Stop share. Yeah, let me take over here. Uh, thanks all for being here. Of course, the findings were different. Uh, so we're, uh, why, why should we expect lots of variation for us um, in a particular microstructure? But before I, I start sharing my, uh, my slides, I really uh, want to thank many of you who are here today for participating in this project, for honoring the deadlines, for what we saw exposed, ex exercised lots of effort um, and, you know, to reciprocate, uh, we decided to work hard and get that fall deadline for ourselves for the paper. That's today. So that's why it's a very exciting day and in particular to celebrate that with you. Um, and then now let me uh, use the time I have um, to talk you through um, what we have. Uh, it's, it's a dense paper. Uh, there's lots, lots of stuff in there. And I decided to, um, to, to, to focus on the main storyline that we, uh, that we uh, uh, lay out in the paper. And, and to do that, I went back all the way in a little bit of search and study of where, where the term standard error actually came from. And it was first used in a, in a book by Whitney Yule. Uh, and he, in that book, he, well, it was found in that book. And in that book, he refers to one of his articles, uh, which was published in the British Society uh, um, of um, uh, Royal Society, I think, in 1897. And I started reading through it and I came across the following uh, paragraph where it says, uh, it's evident that one word in general expect to make a smaller standard error in estimating x1 uh, if you take two associated variables, x2 and x3, rather than only one. So, so every additional data point, if you will, uh, reduces the uncertainty uh, of the estimator, um, and and that's that's basically the, um, um, the the background for why we thought non-standard errors was a good term uh, for uh, measuring uh, the analytic variation across researchers when they do the same um, uh, exercise. So they all test uh, the same hypothesis in the same data set. Uh, and you know, I just uh, updated the quote a little bit here, or uh, changed the quote a bit. It's evident that one would, in general, expect a smaller standard error in estimating X1 if you actually engage uh, two appropriate research teams, X2 and X3, rather than only one. Okay, and in some sense, if a, a result holds up, uh, if you if you let it be done by multiple uh, research teams, then it must be uh, you know a, a robust result. 
Um, so known standard errors, 342 other uh, authors, many of, uh, of you are here today from 34 countries, 270 research institutions, mostly university, and today is the, is the release of the paper. Uh, here, is, uh, here are the names of all uh, co-authors. Uh, if, you, if you are part of it, you'll find yourself here. Here are the, uh, all the institutions that participated, uh, mostly universities from really all over the, the globe. And the coordinators, uh, and I, I, I want to uh, bring them out as, on a separate slide because we spent a lot of time uh, prepping for this and, and, and while the experiment was going on, while the project was going on, I'm just going to read them out uh, because it was not only me, it was Anna Dreyber, Felix Holzmeister, Jürgen Huber, Magnus Johannissen, Michael Kirchler, me, Sebastian Neusius, Michi Rasen, and Lutz Weitzel, and in particular the two junior guys did a, did a, a, a ton of work called Felix Holzmeister and, and, and Michi Rasen. Uh, it's essentially a, um, a joint uh, project, the Stockholm School of Economics, University of Innsbruck, and, and us here in Amsterdam. Um, background, um, and I'm going to be relatively brief since Anna positioned the study uh, already quite clearly. Uh, but before uh, I can talk about that background, let's, let's at least define this notion of non standard error more precisely. Um, it's a new term. And, and, and we uh, work by the, uh, we, we propose the following working definition. It's the dispersion across teams when they do the same thing. Uh, so dispersion and standard measure for it is standard deviation. Uh, so standard deviation across researchers for results they report when they independently uh, uh, test the same hypothesis on the same sample. Okay, that's, that's the working definition that we take throughout the paper. And you know, to put that into perspective, uh, non-standard errors basically um, reveal a level of uncertainty above and beyond standard errors. So this is what I was told in grad school. Uh, so, so we have a population that's unknown. We pull samples from it in a data generating process. And then we design estimators that go after uh, estimating an object in the population, okay? And, and if we build good estimators, uh, the mean of the estimator is going to be exactly the, uh, the, the object of interest plus a residual. And the standard deviation of that residual, which is the uncertainty because we have a finite sample, is, is uh, called the standard error. Now, what we do here, and that's you know, how we motivate our term, is it doesn't stop there. Data, data uh, uh, any empirical science, then this is in finance, economics, uh, sociology, and all, all exact sciences, I think. Um, we, we have the sample and we understand the standard errors and where they come from. But then we, um, we're only starting to understand that there is uh, additional uncertainty because of all the choices that we do along the way. Uh, and, and, and so if we bring that hypothesis to the, to the sample, we start to uh, create evidence. It's an evidence generating process. Um, and, and that evidence, when we generate the evidence, we make all kinds of choices. Uh, so it's the garden of forking path, as Gelman and Lokin call it, and that's the source of non-standard error. And it's our, it's our um, focus, like what is, that, what is the magnitude of this non-standard error? And can we explain it, understand it? And can we somehow uh, reduce it? And that's, that's the focus. That's really the focus of this project. Important. Uh, well, um, you could you could say, um, and that's that's what Anna already mentioned. Uh, it's particularly important because it provides a scope. If you have a lot of non-standard error, that provides a scope for selective reporting on the side of researchers or selective publishing on the side of, of journals when they pick the papers that have most uh, statistical significance or statistical significance at all. Uh, so that those are the degrees of freedom that you have as a researcher. Um, um, and as a, as a journal uh, to work with. So uh, even in the absence of a bias, it's still interesting. So suppose we're all the kosher and everything was cool. And, and even if we, um, uh, we don't have the selection in the, uh, in the reporting and the publishing of papers, it's still worthwhile to measure the uncertainty that's there because we take different choices along the way. Sources of non-standard error, and, this, and, and we uh, go through in, in some level of detail in the paper, but think about you know, when you build a statistical model, you have to make all kinds of choices, a non-linear, linear model, what are the covariates, the distribution of residuals. But when you have a statistical model, 
then you take it to the data and you have a host of choices to make again. So you have to uh, construct proxies for the covariates, you have to clean the data outliers, but that's not even the end of it. You, when you execute it, you have to pick software, machine precision, documentation, all these things are potentially important. So the non-standard errors are sourced from the little different levels in the, in the empirical process. Literature, uh, let me skip on this in the interest of time. So the objective, research questions. Number one, how large? How large are these non-standard errors? What's the magnitude uh, in, in finance, um, uh, financial economics? Um, and if there's, if there's dispersion, can we somehow explain it? Or can we relate it to potential explanatory covariates? Can we explain, is it, is it true that, for example, um, if you have less experienced researchers than, than in, in the entire community of, 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 of the crowd, uh, maybe they create the dispersion and, and to what extent? Um, that's just an example. Um, then, you know, we did research, empirical research is not a one stage process. You typically have multiple stages. Um, so when, when we bring in peer evaluation, um, you know, talk at the coffee machine, uh, give seminars, get feedback like we have today, or uh, you see other papers published on the same uh, topic. Um, so does all of that feedback help create some level of convergence in the null standard errors? And, and if so, how much? Um, are researchers themselves accurately aware of the size of these non standard errors? So do we all understand how large they are, how small they actually are? That's, that, those are the overriding um, uh, research questions of the project. All right, let's, let's dive into it, the project design. For those of you who participated, you know, there's some repetition here, but we have a, an audience wider than that. So uh, let's bring everybody up to speed on what, uh, the, uh, what the project entailed. We have uh, essentially, in a nutshell, uh, two sizable sets of representative researchers. The first set are research teams. And in our uh, setup, there are maximum two uh, members large. Um, um, but the, this set of people uh, or, or researchers independently test those hypotheses on the same data. Okay, that's what I've been um, saying for a while. And, and of course, in the, if we then take that results and compute the standard deviation of the results in the cross section, that's our non standard error. Okay, that's how we measure non standard error. But then we bring in the different stages. So we bring in a non overlapping new set of uh, representative uh, researchers who then uh, obtain these papers in a single blind process, um, they evaluate them and they provide feedback. So these peer evaluators do see who, who, who is on the uh, names of the, of the people on the paper um, to create some incentives for the research teams to do well, because it's, it's your peers that are, that are seeing your work, your work here. Um, so those are the peer evaluators. Uh, the sample was kindly made available to Deutsche Börse. We're, we're very uh, thankful to the uh, to Deutsche Börse because this was part of this success. Uh, this is the first time that they provided access to 720 million trades in, uh, in the most actively uh, traded derivative in Europe. So, if you if there's a global investor you wanted to buy, you want exposure to the European economy, this is probably where you go. Um, you, you you take a longer short position in the Eurostoxx index futures. Uh, so those are the 50, uh, in some sense, largest European companies. Uh, the span, we have a long time span, which, which is one of my first personal favorites, 2002, 2018. Uh, and, and this is really new. Uh, we know on every trade, whether it was for clients or it was done on, on your own account. So there's a principle of agent flag. And that's, that's new. That's motivating some of the hypotheses. Because I'll, I'll give you these hypotheses uh, uh, quickly, but they're not, they're not the focus. We're interested in what the results are when the teams test these hypotheses. But they're almost plain vanilla type of um, uh, hypothesis, uh, which is by design because we wanted the researchers to be um, uh, well matched with the, uh, with the tasks at hand. So the first RTH1, so RT is our research team uh, hypothesis to distinguish them from the hypotheses that we had. Um, but the research team hypothesis were um, market efficiency, how did it uh, change over that time span, what's the trend in market efficiency, what's the, the, the trend in, in, in realized bid ask spread, which, which sort of is a gross profit to whoever provided the quote. And then the rest of the hypotheses are going to benefit from the client flag on the data, because we're going to compute the, uh, the share of client volume, total volume. My prior was that was going 
uh, up because uh, there's less intermediation needed if you have uh, execution algos. Um, realized fit for clients only. Um, the clients use more limit orders now that they can, and they have the agency algos and, and gross trading revenues. So those are the, the six hypotheses that the research teams were uh, asked to test with the data that I just described. The stages, the first stage is let's do that. Let's execute that um, analysis and write the short paper. That was done from Jan January 11th this year until March 23. Then the second stage comes in. Uh, so in between these stages, the peer evaluators got the reports, 10 each, um, rated them, uh, provided constructive feedback, and, and, and each research team now gets two uh, reports from peer evaluators. Those are anonymous to them, but they are asked to, to benefit from this feedback to improve their analysis. So they recode and rewrite the paper, and they come in in, this, in, the, in the second stage with, um, with new results. Um, that was from May 10, May 28. Stage three, they all see uh, what the best, what the five highest rated papers were by the peer evaluators. Um, so they get to see sort of what the peers were doing. Uh, they can update the code and, and rewrite the, uh, the papers. And, and by the way, everybody was asked to not only upload the code, the, the, the short paper, but also the code. And four is uh, the research teams to reconsider their results, but now unconstrained by their own code, okay? In the other stages, they have to produce the code um, and, and, uh, and write the results and report. This time, uh, no. So it was really, in a sense, a posterior, after all they've seen, what is now, where do you settle on what your, your estimate is of, of these trends on those uh, six hypotheses? That's, that's the stages in the project. A hypothesis for us, uh, the first three hypotheses were uh, measuring, were only on stage one, measuring the non-standard error and trying to explain it uh, with the quality of the teams, uh, or you know, more precisely, the quality of the, of, the, of, the, of the match between the team and the tasks, the workflow uh, quality um, and, and paper quality. Uh, so is it really true that you know, maybe higher quality uh, is associated with smaller um, uh, non-standard error? Um, let's test that. And then we bring in the additional stages uh, where we have the peer peer feedback uh, on the reports and uh, we, we try to measure if the non-standard error, the dispersion across teams in results actually uh, stays flat, increases or reduces along the way. And you know, this, the second three hypotheses are, are um, for, uh, for each fourth grade stage basically go from stage one to stage two, two to three, two, uh, three to four. And the final, uh, this, the seventh hypothesis is let's go from the first to the last stage. Is there uh, what's the overall change in the non standard error um, or error variance? And, and finally, the accuracy of RT beliefs on, on the size of non, non standard error. There was an in incentivized survey of, uh, of RTs and what, how they, what they believe of uh, what they believe on the cross sectional dispersion and outcome. Um, Team quality, I don't have time to go through this, but we essentially took five uh, attributes. We computed the first principal component to get this as precise an estimate of, of team quality as, uh, as we could. Methodology, um, uh, here, um, we, and this is worth spending some time on, the error here uh, is defined as uh, what is the result uh, that team I has for research uh, team hypothesis J in the teeth stage. So that's Y, I, J, T, okay? And then we, we measure where this team comes out in this, for this hypoth RT hypothesis in this particular stage relative to the overall average. And that's defined as an error. And I like to emphasize that error is not here uh, to be thought of as, as erroneous, like uh, it's wrong. It's, it's more, uh, in a sense, erratic. This is just a natural variation that comes out when we have different preferences on, the, on how we'd like to uh, carry out our research. Okay, so this is, this is then defined U, um, Y, J, T. That's the error. Um, and, and that's related for the first three hypotheses to, to all these covariates, team quality, workflow quality, paper quality, uh, by following a relatively standard and commonly used approach uh, proposed by Harvey in 1976 in Econometrica. Um, and it's, it's, it's fairly simple. Um, we take the log of that squared uh, error and relate it, we regress it essentially 
on a bunch of covariates and, and, and for, for dispersion in, in the results, um, that's going to be um, uh, the covariates that I mentioned. Um, Notes, by the way, the logging um, um, uh, helps to, um, um, to, to, to not let outliers determine the outcomes too much, and so it moderates the influence of outliers, which is a, an, an additional um, a, a desirable property, uh, in my view. Um, uh, online resources for the uh, resources for the project, as Anna emphasized, we followed, we were, we tried to be um, as um, 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 we, we tried to, to, to follow what was recommended by earlier studies uh, to avoid, um, you know, us p hacking our results essentially, or and then us, you know, all 300 and uh, 300 plus co authors. And to do that, um, we actually filed what we were going to execute before we gave any of you or any of the research teams or peer evaluators any data point or instruction sets. Nobody knew anything um, on, on January 11 this year, uh, but then we filed the pre-analysis plan at the Open Science Foundation, which was a, a, an additional benefit other than committing what you're going to do and what the overall hypotheses are that you're testing. And you can all find them here because we opened the safe. In addition to committing, uh, it's actually relatively quick that you can execute the paper because you've made all the, all the choices already. You've made the choices of which hypothesis to test and what methodology to use. Uh, and, and we have a dedicated website that we used in the recruitment and the communication about the project. Uh, we even uh, created a, a YouTube video. And these, these slides are in the, in the cloud. You will find them in, um, on my website. And I'll post the link later. Uh, these are links, so you can, you can click if you're interested. They're also in the paper, of course. Results. OK, I, have, I think about 10 minutes left to talk you through the results and conclude. Um, uh, so the research teams, where did they come from? Uh, I already mentioned they're from, from many countries, 34 countries. This is where they come from over the globe. Most in the US, uh, UK, Australia, but, but a lot in Holland, Germany. Uh, not surprisingly, given uh, that, that the team that resides in Scandinavia and, 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 and Austri Austria, we have a presence there. But this is basically where the, where the, where the teams come from. Uh, peer evaluators is a much smaller uh, set, uh, mostly US. Um, uh, Europe and, uh, and Australia. What's the quality of the think that participants? Well, I, I was amazed personally uh, with, the, with the quality. Here's some statistics uh, of the research teams, which is the first column. About a third had published already. Uh, one of the members in the top five econ and the top three finance journals. Uh, that, that jumps up to 85% for the peer, peer evaluators. Associate full professors in the team, 52% in the research team, 88% of the peer evaluators. Experience in the field, 7.5 on the scale from 1 to 10, 10 being high, uh, and even higher for the peer evaluators. Uh, big data experience, you know, the size of data that we have here um, that is decent, um, uh, etc. So we have 164 research teams, 34 peer evaluators. Quality of the analysis. Uh, well, there is uh, we, we, three of the co-authors. Uh, they, they run an, an, an agency uh, that certifies code for, for example, the Journal of Financial Economics, and they certify all. Of the, not, not certified. They tested all of the code that that the uh, research teams handed in, uh, so that we could, uh, you know, to each research team we could assign a reproducibility score. That came out at 65 out of 100 on average, but lots of variation. Uh, and even though it sounds like low, uh, they, they let us know that it's actually high relative to the other, to the, to the non think um, um, uh, exercises they did. Uh, paper quality is just for peers, 6.2. Uh, in Holland, you would pass with this degree uh, on, the, on 0 to 100, 0 to 10. So that, that's, that's and, but notice the standard, standard uh, deviations there. So there's a lot of uh, variation, which is good because if you want to do a regression, you want to have variation on the right hand side. Okay. Stage one. Um, here, here is the outcome dispersion and estimates. It's uh, notice the log scaling. Uh, so they report an estimate. I'm going to focus an uh, interest of time on efficiency hypotheses and the client volume hypotheses. Um, efficiency, market efficiency. Um, yeah, it's, it's increased or declined depending on who you ask, but most people. 
uh, would think it's declined. Just to explain the, uh, the graphs here, because this, the, the, we're going to use the same graphs in, in the later slides, the box is the interquartile range. The whiskers is the range from 2.5% to 97.5% quantile. So 95% of the observations are in, the, in between the whiskers. And then on top of it, we plotted all the points uh, a bit perturbed horizontally, so you can see where the outcomes are. So all of the results are actually plotted in the uh, in this particular graph. Uh, but of course, what's striking is the, the dispersion, particularly the, uh, the periphery is very, is very um, uh, so it's fat tailed if you want, right? The top mountain conditions we call this. For most of them, there, are, but but in fine volume, which is should be relatively easy to compute because it's you know in total transactions, how much can how, how many of uh, those transactions. Clients, um, that's that. That must be relative. It's a relatively straightforward calculation. Yet there's some variation there. Uh, but for efficiency, you need more creation, creativity, uh, interpretation. So maybe it's not so surprising that uh, that we have more uh, dispersion there. T values of the trend. So the so the, the, the average. Uh, this is all on the, um, average percentage change in these measures. So it's the average percentage change of uh, market efficiency, for example, here the median is at minus 1%. So that decreases by a percent per year is the median uh, estimate here. That's the way to read this, okay? But people are, you know, most people are between plus 1% and minus 10%. That's, that's roughly half of the people are there. That's the way to read this. T-values, um, they're reported on all teams report T-values or implied T values essentially, um, well, let me for sure, T values for all of these trends. So they, we have the average change, yearly change, uh, but that has a T value. Um, and, 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 you know, for, for in finance or economics, we mostly take the 95% confidence interval. So this is the dotted numbers are minus 1.96 to plus 1.96. And everything outside of it uh, would suggest uh, by conventional finance interpretation and statistical significance. Um, so, so most mo for most hypotheses, there's insignificance. But, but mind you, there is um, more than 25% uh, concludes a significant decrease in, in efficiency. So it, it's not that it's, it's a clear clear cut up, and there's there's disagreement there as well. Um, so that's the dispersion of T values, and, and here are some numbers. So, uh, so the T being larger in absolute value uh, than, than 1.96 is by for a third of the team, so they would conclude that, that they find results that significant and mostly um, conclude that there, there's a decline in efficiency, which to me was somewhat surprising with all the technology that we bring to the markets that the efficiency declines. Uh, um, realized spreads, by the way, they, they mostly go down, which is a good sign for a, for a market. Client volume, 50% uh, of significance, and mostly uh, most of the teams conclude significantly less client volume. So, so, so maybe there's more of intermediation along the way, which was counter to my uh, prior. But dispersion, dispersion, dispersion. There's a lot of dispersion. So let's try and explain it. Let's, let's apply uh, Harvey and explain the, uh, the log squared uh, error with the covariates that we have, team quality, the producibility score, that was the cost cut rating, average rating by peers. Um, we don't find much, um, but, but maybe that's not surprising when you have these huge, 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 um, uh, you know, I'm tempted to call them outliers, um, like extreme observations. So um, uh, to see to what extent that, that those extreme observations drive these results, we, uh, we followed standard practice in finance and we winterized uh, on uh, 1 to 99 percent and, and 2.5 to 97 percent, and we trimmed. Winterizing keeps the extreme values, but put them at the quantiles. Trimming simply removes them. If you do that, what you get then is, yeah, now you start to, you start to see some 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 results here. Um, so a 16 percent reduction in variance, uh, and you know, since we have a log formulation, that means an 8 percent reduction in standard deviation or or, or uh, non-standard error. Um, when you um, uh, increase the team quality by one standard deviation. Increase team's quality by one standard deviation reduces um, um, non-squared error uh, by 8%, and by 12%, 
this is essentially half of these coefficients uh, reproducibility. So if you have code that reproduces really well, um, um, in, in the sense of you know move it up by one standard deviation, uh, 12, 12 percent closer to the uh, to the overall average. So it's sort of smaller standard error, one standard error. So there's some results here, but it's it's sort of meager. Um, uh, it's le less than I expected. Uh, but but it, but importantly, they don't go to zero. It doesn't go to zero. It's it's even if you bring all of these dimensions, so team quality, reproducibility scores. If you if you basically dial up the switch to uh, to the top region, uh, so you have the best team uh, with the highest reproducibility and highest peer evaluation. Uh, since we have such a big sample, we can actually uh, do that, and then we we end up with nine uh, analysts or research teams, and then we still have uh, a lot of variation, but uh, but but less than what we saw before. Uh, so now this. The deviation or the, the non standard would be 10 percent on uh, on the first hypothesis and only 0.4 percent on the on the third hypothesis but but notice it's, it's there these things still go these are economically meaningful dispersions uh, for that nine teams if you look at the t values uh, um, not not clear that they agree on statistical significance in either direction because here is a team that thinks that the clients recently client realized fit was up, up significantly and here's a team in that same high quality subset that can, that would conclude it went down to, uh, statistically significantly adding stages and I'm, I'm about out of time I realize so I I want to go through this but now I've, I've explained the the way we set up these uh, box plots so I can go relatively quickly through the rest adding stages so far all the analysis was just on the first stage now we bring in peer evaluation and we open up the window for research teams to see what others were doing, particularly the highest rated uh, results. Here is the, uh, the blue bars were the bars that you saw before. That's basically stage one. The other bars is adding the other stages. And you see that the mass in the middle uh, or the, the interquartile range uh, is reduced. Whereas in the fringes, it seemed that the extremists, there's typically no reasoning with extremists, right? They, they stay where they, where they were mostly. Um, uh, TT values. I'm going to skip over this, but the actual tests, and this is this is where we test our hypothesis four through six and seven. Um, so we basically see does the does the non-standard error or the, or the error variance decrease with the with the stages? And I'd like to focus on the Windsorized sample because of those extreme values, and we have significance basically for all of those stages uh, and across all stages. This would imply a 53% reduction in standard error, non standard error, or the standard deviation across research teams, a 53% in total when we have the peer evaluation process switched on in a way. Okay? And all of these stages add roughly uh, add, add a decent amount of uh, reduction. Beliefs, and this is the final result. Um, here, let me bring you back to where I started. This is the estimates dispersion. So, the non standard error, for example, for RTH1 was uh, this essentially computing the standard deviation of all of these data points here. That's the non standard error, standard deviation of all of those data points. So that's that's the data point I have here. That's the true standard error or the, or the non standard error, uh, the true standard deviation. So that's the non standard error, the realized non standard error. And what I'm going to plot now is um, what people thought it would be. So that now that the, the um, uh, whiskers, uh, the box plot is going to show you where people's beliefs were relative to what the realization was. Very important that, that now we look at the beliefs, the dispersion in beliefs relative to the, uh, to the outcome. Okay. This is where people, people were. Okay. So this is the red dots for all of the other, um, the, 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 non, the true non-standard error, the realized non-standard error. This is what people were thinking, like the 50% um, of the people up to 95% of the people. So they're all below um, what, the, what the realized one. And then maybe you thought, which is what I was thinking, this is just because we have these extremities that nobody predicted. But even if you remove them, you really trim the sample to, to 2.5, 97.5 uh, region, uh, you will root the extremities, you compute the standard uh, deviation again. So we have a sort of adjusted non standard error. Even that orange dot is mostly um, above where people's buildings were. So, so we vastly underestimate uh, non standard errors. And maybe that's the reason why we never really 
um, um, uh, talked about it too much. Conclusion, real quick. You maybe you dozed up, you got distracted by everything else that's going on in the zoo. And, um, come back here because now uh, I'm going to talk you through everything I said in the past 30 minutes in, in, in a one minute summary. Conclusion. Here, here is what we conclude from what we did. Non-standard errors. So the, the, the standard deviation across research teams when they do the same tasks, essentially research tasks, uh, standard deviation across results, that adds uncertainty to the outcome of hypothesis tests. If you were to observe only one research team, then uh, you picked one number, uh, or one path through the, uh, the, the, the garden of forking paths. Um, then you have to realize that had you taken other paths, the outcome might have been different. And that's, that's what non-standard errors are uh, supposed to uh, amend to, uh, to, to measure. Uh, they're the same order of magnitude as standard errors. They're, they're about the same. I didn't have time to, to, to give you the, the ratios, but they seem to, the ratio of non-standard error to standard error, somewhere between a half and three across uh, the different stages and the different hypotheses. So they're equally important in some sense as, as standard errors in terms of the size of uncertainty. They co-vary some with team quality, workflow quality, or paper quality, but only if we look hard um, and we, uh, we, move, we remove the extremities. But where we find real significance is that interaction, uh, feedback, uh, peer evaluating. There's a, there's a ton of uh, action there in, in, in declining or removing or shrinking, I should say, um, a non-standard error, because I don't believe we'll ever get to zero, um, uh, because there, people do uh, have beliefs about how things should be done. Um, and they, the size of these things, non-standard errors, are typically underestimated uh, by participants. I, I've used up all my time. Thanks a lot for tuning in, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you, Albert. Uh, this was fascinating. So we're moving on to uh, Michael Noe. Uh, Michael's gonna, uh, the floor is all yours. Many thanks, uh, Katya, for the, for the introduction. Uh, as you may have seen uh, and mentioned by Katya, I'm with, I'm with Urex, which is the largest derivatives exchange in, in Europe uh, and one of the largest worldwide. Uh, by the way, I will not share slides, but uh, I will just talk you through. Um, we provided the data for this pro very interesting project, and I'm, I'm very thankful for this for this very interesting project. Um, a short background on myself. Uh, I'm, so to say, the guide to for, for quant research on the trading side in Urex, and I'm working with similar data sets like in FinCap on more or less a daily basis. Um, okay. um, um, I will give you, I will not discuss the paper, but I will give you some, some very interesting background facts on, on Urex but I will try not to bore you with the typical corporate blah, blah. Um, uh, but I guess there, still, there will be some facts which might be relevant for the audience here. So the FASIC, so the Eurostox future is one of our flagship products. It's the most liquid future in Europe. Uh, and it trends more, trades more or less around the clock. The entire trading is done on Eurex, so there's no market fragmentation. And it's, it's the actively traded future in Europe asset. And it's, it's more or less the equivalent to the EMI, which is based on the, on the S&P 500. Um, trading at Urex is typically done on the order book, or central limit order book. However, there are always trades which are very large or very complex, which don't fit, the, let's say, the characteristics of the order book. So for, for this kind of trades, we have under certain conditions, uh, the possibility to, to negotiate price in an off book market. Mm. Latency wise, which is always very, people are very interested in latency, high frequency trading. Um, we offer one of the fastest trading systems uh, worldwide, and from, especially on the derivative side, which is a bit more complex than cash equities. Um, but latency, so just the pure average reaction time, is not the most important uh, fact or most important latency characteristic nowadays. It is more like the variation of latency, so the standard deviation, so that you don't have huge spikes and in, in reaction times and these kind of things. Um, and one thing which has developed over the last thing, the comp over the last year since I'm with Eurex, so I'm with Eurex for like 10 years, uh, the competition among the fast participants has, and the reaction times has, has reduced significantly. When I joined Eurex, we were talking about like a few hundred microseconds. Nowadays, we're talking about uh, one digit nanosecond. Um, so one digit nanosecond, the, the differential between the fastest and the second uh, the fastest 
person on completed trace is in the one digit nanosecond area. I guess most of you are aware what one nanosecond is. So it's billions of a second, but more visually, it's like 20 centimeters of fiber cable. <laughs> this is, <laughs> you can see the, the fastest, the second fastest order is like 20 centimeters behind the fastest guy. So it's uh, okay. Um, of course, this, this, uh, this, this, um, this latency and this speed development over the last year might have ne negative impact on customers, the system, blah, 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 and so on. We always work with our customers to, to avoid any negative side effects and uh, to, to take countermeasures to create a level playing field for everyone. Um, One, one more thing is, uh, I, will, I will be finished soon. Uh, one more thing is we provide an order by order market data feed. One important piece here is um, we always make sure that public data is published first. This means, for example, if you, if you get a trade, if you get a fill on your order, you may receive, we will receive a private information. This information has of course value if you receive a private trade information. And to make a create a level playing field, we, we make sure that everyone receives the trade information at the same time, more or less, with the public market data, not with private responses. Other exchanges have a different uh, way of doing this. Um, last not least, I want to thank Albert. Uh, you may hear my kids in the background. Uh, I want to thank Albert and Anna for for the presentation and all the for the all the co-authors for your highly relevant research. It's, we were quite we had your expect quite surprised about the huge variation of the findings by the various research teams. Um, one more thing, I'm always, I'm always, I'm always when I'm on academic conference or read papers, I'm, I'm quite surprised that there's not much done on data based on Eurex. So if you are interested on, on working with Eurex data, I have an idea, then please get in touch. We can either, you can either, uh, potentially we can make something possible to work on the FinCap data set on alternative data sets. But please get in touch uh, with a research proposal and we can potentially make a cooperation on that. And now I need to get to my kids. Uh, thank you very much. I hand over back to Katya. Michael, I think uh, the over 200 participants that are listening, uh, some of them have a question in their mind, how do we get in touch? <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, you will find my email address on, on the web, but you can also, it's just michael.noy at urex.com. But you can find my, if you Google for my name, then you will find the email address. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you for, for the data. This is, uh, of course, the project couldn't exist without uh, the great data that uh, you provided. So thank you very much uh, for the presentation. So we're going to take a very short five minute break. I was supposed to be 10, but uh, we're a little bit slow. So uh, come back at the top of the hour. Uh, it's uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time and um, whichever time zone you're in, come back at the top of the hour. Uh, thank you. So we'll 